this is Beth. And this is Jeff. And this is your Enneagram Coach, the podcast, where we're here to help you to understand yourself with astonishing clarity so that you can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Christ. Today, we have a very special guest with us, both personally and professionally. We're going to be talking with our friend, Megan Hyatt Miller, the CEO of Michael Hyatt and Company. Megan's going to share her personal experience with the Enneagram and how Michael Hyatt and Company has utilized the Enneagram for business and professional growth. Hey, Megan, it's so great to have you on our podcast. Hey, guys, it's so fun to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't know the connection that we have. So let's just kind of start there. So really, your Enneagram coach would not exist had I not met you. (laughs) (laughs) Truly. So so many moons ago, I was Megan's personal assistant and loved that job. But the, the really the intriguing part was what you guys do at Michael Hyatt and Company changed my life and enabled mm. us to do all that we're doing with your Enneagram coach and all the people that are listening right now. Wow. There's just no way we would have been able to get the message out of hope and transformation without you, your dad, and the team. So mm. just want people to know how it all started. I uh, was your personal assistant and then jumped over and was your dad's personal assistant for a while. And, and then your Enneagram coach really started taking off and I had to say goodbye. I still remember the day that she called and said that, Hey, do you know the Hyatts? Cause I I think I just got a job with, with the daughter. (laughs) That's so funny. And and I've been reading um, your, your dad's book uh, on platform uh, Mm -hmm. for some mediation stuff that I was doing. And so thrilled. And what was so special about it is you guys were so generous in Mm -hmm. allowing her to blossom. So that was you and Joel well, were and it was really fun. So, mm-hmm. you know, while I was, you know, helping to take care of a lot of things at your house and just getting to know your family, the job allowed me to listen to all that you guys were putting out. So mm-hmm. everything on Platform University, everything on your YouTube channels, your podcast. So I was just absorbing all of this incredible content that other people just don't have the privilege in their daily mm-hmm. jobs to absorb. <laughs> and then there was one day I was like, huh. I wonder if we could do something similar with the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the beginning, the birthing in my mind of getting all of this great content Mm -hmm. out to others. So I just want people to know how we got to know each other. I got to be blessed by your family, watching your kids grow up. Um, Of course, there's still some, some are older, some are younger, Um, (laughs) but just kind of being a part of your family was just so special. Mm -hmm. And your parents as well. I always tell people, like they're the real deal. Cause you know, sometimes mm-hmm. you're around people that have great influence and you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. That's right. So the Hyatt mm-hmm. family, they're the real deal. So just thank mm-hmm. you so much for wow. the opportunity, the, the care, the love that you guys gave us all those years. So anyway, I just want to well, thank you. For thank that. you. You guys are so sweet that that is so fun to kind of like relive that story and remember how it all began. And <laughs> it's such a blessing, first of all, uh, to have you in our home during that period, uh, helping us, you know, that was a really critical time after we had adopted our middle boys with five children ages 19 to one now. Uh, right. But at that time, it had been just a few years since we had adopted our boys. And it was so helpful, you know, and so it's, it's great that that blessing was able to be reciprocated uh, and, you know, reciprocal and that we were able to help launch you into something um, that, gosh, has helped to impact so many people now. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what you and Joel do um, with Michael Hyatt and company, because it, your, your personal story kind of overlaps, uh, well, not only just with your dad's <laughs> story, but his professional story as well. And so uh, tell us about how you guys met and your, I mean, you've told us a little bit about your family, but then how that translated into your professional life. Yeah. So my dad and I are in business together. We have a company called Michael Hyde and Company, which is a performance coaching company that helps um, really high achieving leaders and their teams uh, get the vision, alignment and execution that they need to uh, achieve something that we call the double win, which for us means winning at work and succeeding at life. So, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about how to be more successful professionally, how to grow your business, things like 
like that. But what they don't often talk about is how do you do that successfully while also making sure you're succeeding in other areas of your life, like your family and, you know, your most important relationships, your health, your investment in your community, spiritually, all those things. We yeah. really want to be about helping people accomplish a holistic version of success that addresses all important parts of life, not just like this one dimensional success that often comes at the expense of everything else. So we do that through uh, a few things. We have a physical paper planner product called the Full Focus Planner, uh, which has been really successful. And we also have a an executive coaching program for business owners called Business Accelerator. And then we do one-on-one and corporate uh, training. So mm-hmm. one-on-one coaching and corporate training. So those are kind of the main areas of our business. And it's been really fun to watch it evolve over the years since we met each other. A lot has changed. A lot has changed. And, yeah. Um, we're really grateful for the impact that we've been able to have. Yeah, so remember. that's, that's a business. I remember when you guys were brainstorming the full yeah. focus planner. I mean, cause right. it, when I, at the time I was working for your dad and we got shipment after shipment of all these different planners. So you guys could brainstorm like what works, what doesn't work and really right. consolidating the best of mm-hmm. what you guys offer and to see mm-hmm. it now. Cause I have it. I even have the Megan Hyatt edition <laughs> with, the, with the bold colors, which yes, I love. Yes, yes. Awesome. Um, but to see it in person and to then execute it is really remarkable. Yeah. So I just highly recommend the the full focus planner. And then the tutorial Thank videos you. that you guys have really yeah. was helpful um, mm-hmm. to, because if you don't have that, it can be a little like, okay, what do I do? You know, I mean, cause it, right. but you have purpose and meaning for every little category. It's not yep. just a planner. It has purpose mm-hmm. and meaning. And so those tutorials were yep. really helpful for me and making sure that I was dialing into exactly how to use it correctly. Now, of course, yeah. the goal is to use it all the time, which, that's right. you know, <laughs> as a type nine is something that moving to my yes. three is very helpful I, to have. I, that's it. Right. I have a lot of thoughts about each type using the full focus planner. Oh, yes. that would be a great conversation. I'd love to hear that. Because <laughs> they all have, yeah, there's all kinds of... In, Interior yep. stuff that's going on that either help them to excel or how they face uh, yeah. certain challenges. Now, what's interesting yeah. about your story too, and about Michael Hyatt and company is that um, you guys have a relationship with Ian. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ian and Cron. That's right. Mm-hmm. With Ian Cron. So before Beth started working with you guys, um, yeah. Ian was writing his book, The Road Back to You. And you're, that's right. Dad's that's backyard. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so fun. So Ian is one of my dad's best friends, mm-hmm. has been just a great friend to our family for a long time. And so really, you know, my journey with the Enneagram, my husband, Joel, you know, mentioned Joel, um, Joel and I discovered really the Enneagram through Ian yeah. and our relationship with him. I mean, when what year would that have been? I'm thinking that would have been at least five years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember. You remember that conference that we went to at Otter Creek Church together? Yes. Um, that time yes. that he yes. was speaking there. I'm, so I'm trying to remember when that would have been. It was it predated that somewhat, but it was around that time. So five years ish ago. Yeah, I think it was 2015 because I remember you even saying, "Hey, okay. you know my my dad has a friend and he's writing a book on the Enneagram." Because I think I had mentioned to you, like, yeah, "Hey, do you yeah, guys yeah. use the Enneagram?" And you're at the time you weren't because you didn't know it. Right. Um, right. And I was like, oh my gosh, someone's writing a book on the Enneagram in the backyard of Michael Hyatt. Like, this is intriguing. This is exciting. Cause at that time I'd been using <laughs> the Enneagram for about 15 years. And so I wanted uh-huh. to be able to like pick his brain and everything. Sure. So yeah, it was about that time. Yeah. So, so how did that land That's on you so guys great. learning about the Enneagram? Well, it's so funny. So I remember going to that event. So I had been reading prior to that, Richard Rohr was kind of my introduction. Mm -hmm. So I'd read parts of his book and didn't really land on a type. I think when I went into that particular conference, I thought I probably am a type one. Um, I really had that sense of the critical inner voice. And, you know, so I was Mm -hmm. pretty sure I didn't really... There were parts of it I didn't resonate with, like the rule following thing wasn't really so much me, which, you know, knowing that I ended up discovering that I'm really a four makes sense. But at that time, that's kind of what I went in with. And I remember trying to figure 
Joel out. I don't think he went with me that first day. And I, I like took all these notes. I thought for sure he was a nine. It's so funny to me now because he's a five and he is definitely, if all you have to do is see the number of books in our house to know for sure he's a five. <laughs> it's like that, that would be the fastest diagnostic, you know, ever. Um, but uh, I thought he was a nine. And I remember telling Joel some of what Ian said, and he was so offended. He was like, that is, I, I just like, I can't even like wrap my head around that. And I think it's so rude and condescending. I don't even know if I've ever told Ian this story. It's so funny, but he was just like, there's no way that that's me. Like he was just offended. And he was like, I, I don't even know if I buy into this whole thing. You know, like he was just like rejecting the whole thing. So that's how it started. We were both mistyped, you know, and, and just kind of had to figure it out. But then we ended up, um, talking with Ian, reading a lot and really kind of got into it. And I remember hearing at that conference Ian talking about force. And the, the funniest thing that I remember that he said was that, um, you know, you will always know a four because there's always some, some thread figuratively or literally a purple, like there's just a lot of purple with fours. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's my entire childhood. Like that's yeah, everything, that's you know, everything I ever had was purple gr growing up. I was like, this has to be something. So that was kind of how I had an inkling that I was a four, but really fast forward. It wasn't until I, I was so torn up about like, am I one, am I a four, you know, just such mm -hmm. an existential crisis, which again is so four of me that like <laughs> this was happening. It was just all hilarious. But I, I ended up having a one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of consult with him and just mm. saying like, I really think I'm a one. And he pulled out Beatrice Chestnut's book, um, the complete Enneagram. And yeah. he mm -hmm. opened up the part about, um, an, uh, for w the, the, uh, self-preservation for mm -hmm. the counter type. He said, yeah. Just, just, yeah. And he just said, just read this and tell me what you think. And I was like, Ian, how did you know? <laughs> he's like, he's like, allow me to explain this concept called subtypes. Yeah. And anyway, at that moment, I was like a hundred percent, every box I'm checking this, this explains my entire life. So that was super helpful. And Joel, I think somewhere probably before that figured out that he was a five and it's, you know, as I said, it's funny to think we ever thought anything different. No, this is just a, a curiosity on my part. But, yeah. Um, we were just staying with another family friend that you guys also shared, the Andersons, uh, Steve oh, and Karen yeah. Anderson. We yes. were staying in their cottage. Yes. And I know that many of the Hyatt team did their one-on-ones with Ian in the cottage. Yes, they did. What, did you have your one-on-one -on -one with Ian in the cottage too? No, we actually oh, okay. did it on Zoom. I mean, well, he was in the cottage. Oh, I don't know why we didn't do it in person, but we did so it on fun. Zoom. It was so, so very 2020 of us way okay. back then. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny to think. So we were there for several months and then the Cronches moved back in because they're in a season of transition as well. It's like this right. Enneagram nucleus cottage that's happening <laughs> okay, in well, downtown Franklin. I have one more part to that. I actually lived there in 19, <laughs> uh, let's see, no, 2006. 2005, really? 2006, I lived there before I moved to Colorado for a little well, while. So see, now great we've all lived there. Happen. I mean, just, that's just amazing, <laughs> that little cottage. That little cottage. Exactly. <laughs> so much has come from it. Okay, so... You just answered the one question we wanted to ask, but I think you probably will have another answer to it. So the question is, you know, do you have a story from your childhood that really highlights you being a type four? So you said the the mm. purple, but is there something else that you can look back and oh, go? Oh, yes, I can oh. tell you for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's so funny. I didn't even think about this before. So I think one of the ways that I knew I was a four was that shame is always kind of like the mm -hmm. undercurrent for me, you know, and if, if I were on with my husband, Joel, he would tell you that, you know, if I have a bad day, I can just do this doom loop where one thing leads to the mm -hmm. other. And it turns into that, that thing that, you know, the Enneagram experts call interjection, where it's yes. like, you know, I've, I'm turning inward on myself. I've weaponized, you know, whatever is happening as though it's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, um, some friends of my parents who lived in Texas when we, I was born in Texas, uh, I was probably like six years old or something. And I remember going into their house and they were kind of intimidating to me. They were kind of like intellectuals and what, for whatever reason, I, I mean, I was six, so maybe everyone intimidated me, but they had <laughs> these like doilies on the back of their chairs. Okay. Like mm -hmm. kind of like old people would have, you know, yep. like your grandparents might've had, except they were my parents age. Anyway, it seemed like very fancy to me. And I remember as a little girl that I put my hand 
on the doily, but I'd like never been in anybody's house that had doilies on their furniture. <laughs> and true. I was convinced in that moment that I had done something horribly wrong. Mm. And I just started apologizing like profusely. Like I just had this like wash mm. of shame, you know, mm. come over me that I was like, something was wrong with me that I had done something wrong. And I feel like that is a feeling I have had many times in my life, you know, sure. more well concealed as an adult, but mm. that feeling of being out of place, that feeling of not knowing what to do, even though on the outside, you know, I might look like I have it all together on the inside. Mm. Oftentimes there's some kind of serious self-doubt that is kind of in play. And I think that, um, over correction in that moment as a, a six yeah. year old or however old I was, it's kind of a good caricature of what's happening even today. I mean, I feel like I've grown a lot for sure, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that can still happen to me. So, yeah. so it looks different are, on the outside, but it feels the same on the inside. Yeah. Right. So true for everyone. Right. Now yeah. uh, there are a lot of, um, parents who will hear your story Mm -hmm. and wonder how do they parent their four child in the, that, those moments? What do yeah. you think eventually, how did your parents adjust to this kind of shame spiral for you mm -hmm. to help you with that? We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, did you know that you can learn how to walk with people through the Enneagram and see their lives transform right from the comfort of your own home while making an incredible income? We'll find out more by going to yourenneagramcoach.com forward slash BEC. There, you can become a certified Enneagram coach and help others discover just how God made them to be. Again, it's yourenneagramcoach.com forward slash BEC. Yeah, I think it was hard. I'm the oldest of five. So, and there's almost 11 years between me and my youngest sister. All, all of us are girls, which God bless my parents. I can't, as a mom of five kids, I only have two daughters, one of whom is only a year and a half old. I can't even imagine five daughters. It's kind of crazy. Um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I think they were like kind of bewildered. You know, my mom is uh, an Enneagram nine with a very strong one wing. Mm -hmm. My dad is a three. And I think for my mom, like my, the depth of and intensity of my emotions was like blew her hair back a lot of the time. <laughs> You know, I mean, I think she was just like, whoa. Uh, and so there was just kind of a lot of like, when I, when I was younger and in my teen years, I think just the challenges of trying to manage those totally different personality types. Yeah. I think we have both really grown in our ability to appreciate mm -hmm. each other and kind of make space for each other. Uh, my dad and I are just more naturally alike. And I think that was, it, it was easier for him, but I think it was, it was hard. I mean, I think they did a great job of encouraging all of us to be who we are and give expression to that, you know, but I think the emotional part of it was tough. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, you know, I, I, I think one of my children, my 17 year old stepdaughter is a four also. And, you know, I think that just knowing that there's going to be a lot of intensity and that the background question all the time is, is there something wrong with me? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's helpful to know. And that, you know, you really do have to make a lot of space for those feelings and, Right. Um, and also I think as uh, hopefully, you know, as we mature to challenge those of us who are fours to get out of ourselves, you know, I think that's, there's a, that's a hard balance as a parent, you know, but I think that that's, um, at least that's kind of the coaching conversation that is in my own head, uh, yeah. with myself these days. And I think as I'm parenting, um, a daughter who may very well be a four, you know, that's in my head as yeah. well. So well, I can totally see where you're coming from, you know, having parents that are a nine and a three, mm -hmm. you know, the nines, we like to keep our emotions and everyone else's emotions kind of like <laughs> in the middle, a little happy, right. a little sad, but nothing too much, you know, so yeah. we're really trying to yes. navigate that and predict yep. it and channel it. Um, well, even thinking from the perspective of a three of her dad, well, like emotions yeah. are a liability, right? Yeah. And so yeah. three is kind of pushing your emotions and identity aside to take on a persona. I can see how as a little girl, it 
You were God's gift to your parents. Yeah, opening the emotions, <laughs> <laughs> opening the depth. Yeah. I was definitely uh, like a lightning rod in that way, probably. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Bless their hearts to have their first kid be a four, you know, That's gosh, right. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So now that you know you're a four, self preservation mm-hmm. four, and do, yep. do you feel like you have a stronger three wing, five wing? Where do you kind of Definitely lean? a three wing. Yeah. That's definitely. what I was guessing. But. I can, yeah, I can certainly. Um, um, kind of have that researchy part. And, and I would say I have a, I really am introverted. And so, mm-hmm. um, I don't, that part of the three does not exist for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew for sure I wasn't a three because I don't have that desire to be a performer, mm-hmm. you know, in this, um, business kind of succession plan that we have, um, between my dad and me, it was very important to me that, uh, I would not, kind of be the sole face of the company. I'm certainly happy to do some of that, but it does not come naturally to me. I've had to like learn to embrace that and step into that and own that sure. space where I think it really did come naturally for him, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the five part sort of shows up for me in that desire to just, you know, keep it quiet. Like I get overwhelmed kind of from a sensory standpoint, if it gets to be too much, which also happens for my husband, Joel, who's a mm. five, um, but definitely my wing is, you know, I'm like 99% three wing. Not sure that's a technical way of describing it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it totally makes sense. Um, and, and so then how have you used the Enneagram, uh, in your personal life and then also in your professional life? What's that looked like? Yeah. Well, the thing that I always tell people about the Enneagram that I appreciate the most is that it gives us a common language in our relationships. Mm. And I think that this is true for me, both personally and professionally in my marriage and my conversation, uh, conversations with my family. So my whole family of origin is really into the Enneagram. So everybody knows what they are. Mm -hmm. We all know what our spouses or significant others are, you know, so that's just a regular topic of conversation. I think it helps to explain differences in a way that does make them good or bad. You know, it just, it just makes us unique. And I think that's helpful because so often our conflicts come through our differences when Mm -hmm. we assume that one is better or worse, you know, or we're trying to reconcile those things instead of just make space for people to be who they are. So I, I think that's been really helpful. I also think it's been helpful to have a language both for myself and with in relationship with others for growth. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I really care a lot about personally and professionally is growth. We, I mean, really our, our whole company exists to help people grow in many ways. Um, and I think that the Enneagram gives you kind of like a shorthand for an individualized path for your own growth. So I love that. You know, yeah. I think that helps me know where I'm likely to get hung up as a leader, uh, where I'm likely to get hung up as a parent, as a spouse. Um, we have gone so far as to have Ian come several times to teach our staff and also our clients uh, about the Enneagram in years past. And so mm-hmm. it's a kind of a common language within our company as well. And, you know, I think that that's helpful to explain why we do what we do naturally also how we need to grow. I think the most important thing as an, as an organizational leader is that the Enneagram, I've seen it kind of used in good ways and bad ways Mm -hmm. where it's bad, you know, is if people use it as an excuse to just be kind of on the low side of their (laughs) number, you know, like, well, I'm just a one. So, you know, I'm just going to be critical or, you know, I'm just a four, so I'm going to be self-absorbed or what, you know, it's like there, there can never be as you mature in this. I think it's so important never to allow yourself or, you know, if you're a leader to allow in your culture, people to get to a place where it becomes an excuse. It really should be kind of an admonition, you know, Mm -hmm. a, a, a growth edge for for spiritual and personal development. So yeah, when we train, we always say, don't use it as a sword or a shield. And, oh, that's good. Yeah. It's just, it's so true. And it's not just a sword towards others. It could be a sword towards ourselves. ourselves. That's right. You know, and so often we see our struggles and we just want to heap on self condemnation and shame. And, and that only makes us spiral out of control all the more. But yeah, totally. I've heard people say the same thing like, well, Jeff, I'm a nine. Sometimes, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, oh, procrastinate. We, we, or... we, we still do that with one another. We do. And then we call <laughs> each other out on it. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions that I had, uh, so I had a little bit of time working with customer support with uh, Michael Hyatt and company. And yeah. one of the things that Beth and I noticed, and some people are curious about is that 
cultures can take on a bit of the personality of its leaders. Mm -hmm. And Michael Hyde and company, yep. in, in light of several different threes that are on the team, has a little bit of a three culture to it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. What was it like for you being a four, trying to be yourself, but yeah. also in this three culture? What was that like for you? Yeah, it's funny. It's definitely not the dominant number that we have anymore. I actually think eight might be almost the dominant number. We have really? a lot of eights. We have a lot of female eights, which is really cool. I, I yeah. love female eights. And I yes. love right. that our company is like a safe and welcoming place for them to come and share their gifts. I think that's really awesome. Um, but real, actually we have quite a diversity of numbers at this point, but I do think since my dad is a three, you know, whatever mm -hmm. number uh, the leader is or the founder is can often kind of create that flavor, you know, within the organization. I think for me, you know, my dad and I began talking about our succession plan. So he is now the founder and chairman and I'm mm -hmm. the CEO here in just a couple of days. And uh, congratulations. You know, it was really, by the way. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it was really important to me that stepping into that role, if I was going to do it, that I could do it on my own terms. Like that mm -hmm. was the language I used a lot. And I think one of the things I appreciate the most about my dad is he really understands me. I feel like we have always been close. Um, and he, he's a great listener. He's very, um, empathic. Actually, I think he has a, probably as big of a four wing as I have mm -hmm. of a three wing. So, you know, sure. we're sort of like flip sides of each other in some ways. And he just really made space for me to figure out what it meant to do it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And, so it's it's kind of like part of my job is to take what he's done and and carry it forward, but it's also to make it my own. And so I think that both of those things have to simultaneously coexist. And I really appreciate the um, just kind of the endorsement and the encouragement to do that from him. And so, you know, like I said earlier, part of what that looks like is I don't want to be the single personality in the company, you know, sure. Um, yeah. I also am not the productivity geek that he is, you know, I I'm very productive in my own way, but I have a different way of being productive. It doesn't look the same. I don't love, you know, apps and technology like he does. And we, he, we often joke about that on our own <laughs> podcast. You know, he's like, he's like, let's fight about it. You know, he's always like, let's fight on the podcast. It's so funny. <laughs> not really ever fight, but, but he always thinks it'll make for great podcasting. Um, but anyway, you know, so like just kind of my own way of doing things, I'm a very open hearted transparent mm -hmm. leader. I'm less polished. I'm less kind of formal, you know, and part of that is just the, the difference in our season of life and, mm -hmm. you know, our age and all that. But, um, I don't know, I, I think just kind of figuring out what does that feel, what, what feels good for me and authentic, because I knew that no matter how successful I was, if it didn't feel authentic, it wouldn't last, right. you know, I don't care so much what about insight. Sure this company, yeah. you know, that I don't, I don't want to betray it by, um, you know, not going the distance. So I knew right. in the interest of the company, I had to do it on my own terms in a way that would have integrity and would be authentic. Um, yeah. and I think we found a way to do that. That's good, good for me and good for everybody else. So you guys use a lot of great assessments, strength finders, Colby. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you Enneagram, name it. That's right. Enneagram. Yeah. So it's a great one too, Beth. I don't know if you've heard about it, but what, what is it? <laughs> <Any away? laughs> so in light of all of those, you know, assessments and personality yeah. tests, um, yeah. how do you guys use the Enneagram in a different way? What sets it apart? Well, I don't think we use the Enneagram as part of a hiring process, for example, mm -hmm. because I think that, you know, maybe it would be too strong to say that it would be unethical because sometimes people tell us they know that we're in the, in the Enneagram. And so, for example, I just hired a chief of staff as part of my transition into this new role, and she's an eight mm -hmm. uh, and she is fantastic. She has like all the horsepower I could ever need. It's so amazing <laughs> to have somebody I could just pitch to and sure. she's like born, born to catch. She's ready, yes, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah, so, so she shared that right off the bat. Now, sometimes people do and they don't, but we don't really use it in our hiring process. Mm -hmm. It's really more for um, self-knowledge. So it's something that in the past we've provided to our team in terms of uh, professional development, really personal development in a professional context for people to just understand more about themselves. It also is something that we would use in coaching our employees and just kind of having intelligence around that. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that it's, it's almost like 
it's such a powerful tool and it tells you so much more that is way outside of a professional context. I mean, you are just, you all of a a sudden have like x-ray vision into somebody that I think that it's, it's really important to steward that knowledge with wisdom Mm -hmm. and care because you can hurt people with it, you know? And, and so, um, so that's why we don't use it. It's, it's not like we go into a position when we're going to hire somebody and say, um, you know, I need a chief of staff. Therefore this person has to be an eight. I have no idea. You know, theoretically that person could be any number. There probably are given that position, some numbers that would more likely gravitate toward it. Um, but we, we don't want to be biased by that on the front end, you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and people ask us all the time, you know, okay, well, so an engineer must be a five, right? And I'm like, no, any type can be an engineer, you know, but yes, could there be some attributes that, each type has that could benefit them in certain areas. Yeah. I mean, could they also have liabilities? Sure. Yeah. Um, But I think that's really wise that you guys, you know, not use it as a hiring, um, you know, process. And like you said, Mm -hmm. gosh, if we do not use it right as leaders, it can really be detrimental. But at the same time, if we use it really well, it can speak volumes to our team. Like we have a type six who, um, works outside of the company as a, as a contractor. Uh And, you know, unfortunately the past people that were doing some of the behind the scenes tech stuff, it kind of messed up a few things. And so we had to get Mm -hmm. that corrected. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he was faithful and responsible and got in there and did it, but he never said, Hey, I just want to make sure, you know, this wasn't me that made this mistake. You know, he just Mm. faithfully got in there, but I knew it'd be really important because six is fear being blamed or targeted. Ah. And so I just went in there and I said, Hey, I know this you know, the initial thing was not your fault. And I'm so grateful that you were faithfully getting Mm. in there and just speaking the language of his type. And he came up to us at a dinner and said that that was so powerful and meaningful. Mm. And so we can really use it for good if we know where they're coming from and how to speak into their life and really help Mm -hmm. them to excel right where they're at. But again, you can do the complete opposite if you use it in a way like you, you know, weaponizing it. So I'm, I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. And of course that's how I felt with you guys, you know, at Michael Hyatt and company, like you guys just always, you know, really helped us to excel right where we're at, not trying to Mm -hmm. become something that we're not. And that was always really, really powerful. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're after, you know, from a professional development standpoint is we want to take kind of the raw materials of our team members and help to develop those into their fullest potential. You know, we kind of want to enter into a partnership with our employees Mm -hmm. to help them become all that they were created to be, not to, to kind of make them in our own image. You know, that's not the goal. It's really that we want to take who they are and help that blossom and, and, and reach its potential. So I think Beth, what you said is just perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. Being able to speak in that language and understand motivations is so helpful when yes. you're trying to communicate, if, if nothing else, you know, that, that is a huge, uh, huge leg up. Yeah, exactly. Well, when it's just observing how you've taught or, um, brought the Enneagram to your team culture, uh, by having some workshops and then by even providing one-on-one coaching, maybe typing interviews and some, mm-hmm. just an initial steps to take once they find out their type. Um, what else have you found that has really been helpful as an organization in installing the Enneagram into your team culture? I mean, the, the easiest one that everyone goes to is that put your number on your Zoom video or something so yeah, that everybody yeah, yeah. knows it all the time. But what have you found that has really, really helped? Well, I mean, I, I think that we just use it as a common language. I think that we have been very clear about what we're going to tolerate and not tolerate with regard to, you know, that kind of weaponizing shield, you know, kind of thing that, that you were talking about mm-hmm. a minute ago, you know, that it's that it's all about just operationalizing it. And I think what that looks like is talking about it. And so I think we talk about it pretty frequently, um, probably less than we did, you know, back several years ago when it was brand new for us. but but we do talk about it. And I think that that, um, comes up as a great way to appreciate people, to understand who they are. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, it's a shorthand in getting to know people who are new to our team as well. So, I mean, I think beyond the bringing in the training, reading books together, um, the most important thing is just that you're talking about it and just that you're using it as a, as one of many tools to understand yourself and, and one another better. Yeah. 
And I think even like when, you know, us leaders do reviews, I think it's even great just asking mm-hmm. the hard questions of, hey, has there been anything that we have done or said, or even the perception mm-hmm. of that has really landed on, on you in a way that seems hurtful, or maybe you're not understanding, or you feel, you know, mm-hmm. criticized? Is there anything that we can do to mm-hmm. kind of bridge that gap? You know, and I think yeah. that's a hard question to ask. But I think if we realize, hey, a lot of us are trying, and it's just like love languages, right? We try to love someone the way we want to be loved, yeah. or, and same with the yeah. We're trying to uh, communicate or relate to people the way we want to be related mm-hmm. to or communicated to, but a lot of times we miss the mark. And right. so just opening that up, I think that really speaks volumes as leaders to, yep. to say, Hey, I'm not going to always get it right. And that's okay. But I also need totally. you to communicate with me where I might be missing it, obviously in a kind way, mm-hmm. where am I missing it? And how can I better communicate? How can I reconcile? How can I restore anything that may be off a little bit? And I think when, yep. when employees hear us do that and they can see vulnerability and humility, man, mm-hmm. they're just willing to go the distance, you know, for yeah. the leadership, for the team, um, the community as a whole, and just the products that we offer too. I think that's really true. And one of the things we talk a lot about with our coaching clients and our business accelerator coaching program is the necessity of self-awareness as a leader. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that happens, uh, the more your company grows, the more successful you become is you become insulated from people who will tell you the truth. Oh, and yeah. uh, that's a problem. That's a real liability. Um, especially if you care about growing, if you care about reaching your own potential and really being able to make a meaningful contribution. Um, you know, when you were talking about that, Beth, I was thinking that one of my favorite books on this topic is Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Mm. Um, It is a fantastic book. And she talks all about how to give and solicit candid feedback within your team. And we've done this at Michael Hyatt and Company. It's now integrated into kind of my one-on-one rhythm, meeting rhythm with my direct reports, where once every six months, I'm asking them to share candid feedback with me about my leadership, um, because I figure nobody's closer to me than they are, you know, in that regard. And I need to know what they're thinking. I need to know where it's not working. I need to know what needs to be shifted or adjusted. And you know, too often that kind of feedback is happening one way um, from us as leaders to our uh, our team. Mm-hmm. And we really miss a lot of the intelligence that we can get um, that ultimately helps us to have self-awareness. Absolutely. You know, one thing that um, another benefit of being around um, the whole Hyatt team was it, it, the, the idea of limiting beliefs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And self-sabotage. Yes. Now, it, yeah. I had been a pastor previously, and so I had other spiritual language that I used for that yeah. concept. But as it relates to the Enneagram, there are certain ways that I interpret my experience as a leader totally. that can actually be harmful when my team is actually trying to advocate on my behalf, mm-hmm. but I am the one who needs to get out of the way because of my mm-hmm. own beliefs or... Um, yeah. Limiting beliefs. Yeah, limiting mm-hmm. beliefs. So helpful, uh, mm-hmm. particularly in how the Enneagram has addressed that. Uh, Beth's term, I think it's, the common term is uh, uh, the Enneagram is a non judgmental friend. It just mm-hmm. kind of says it. It's, it's not personal. You're like everybody else with that particular personality <laughs> type, uh, which it can be both disturbing, mm-hmm. but it can be redemptive and restorative mm-hmm. because it gives us mm-hmm. insight to where we didn't have it before. Yeah. No doubt. So one of the significant things that I remember in our time um, with the Hyatt team was best year ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matter of fact, we had the opportunity to help. uh, I can't remember what we were doing, but we were working the event, the live event, but we got to sit in on it and it was so right. We were sitting next to Ray Edwards. That's right. That's right. We (laughs) got to talk to Ray Edwards. That was so fun. fun. We love Ray. Tell me about the history of Hyatt and Company and yeah. its focus on goal setting, how that all came about and how long you've been doing it. Yeah. So we have been doing this since, uh, gosh, probably 2014, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and, you know, my dad has had a proprietary goal setting process that he kind of 
built over, you know, a series of decades, really, that he had come to rely on. And as I came into the business and I was working with him and I, at some point I just said, hey, we need to make this a course. People need to know this. People basically only know how to make New Year's resolutions. And what we know for sure is that is not working. We'll try it every year. And they need to know this process. Yeah, we'll try it every year, even though it never works. And it feels great for like 48 hours and then you're on to something else. Um, So anyway, we we launched a course back then. It's so funny to look back at the very first version that we did. We shot it um, up in uh, Hmm. Canada with our video producer at the time. And it was just all thrown together. Mm. And, you know, it's like, it was Mm -hmm. our first draft. And it was, it was great, but it's, it's just been something that's been super successful for us. And I think the reason for that is because we take people through a research based Mm -hmm. step-by-step five-step process actually to set annual goals. And at this point, we've had over 40,000 people go through this, your best year ever course and have had Mm -hmm. extraordinary results. And many, many, many people go through it year after year. Many people go through it with their spouse or even with their teenage or adult children, uh, my own teenage kids love it. They were, they're so excited uh, to participate that in that process this year. So anyway, that's wow, kind of where it that's started. That's awesome. Now, what are some of the biggest things that uh, having done this since 2014, thousands of people mm-hmm. having gone through the program, yeah. what are the big highlights of here's what really makes it yeah. work and here's what's going to get in your way? Mm. Yep. Well, a few things I would say, and you know, this is a year unlike any that we yes, have seen sure. before. That would probably be the understatement <laughs> of our lifetime. And <laughs> right. And one of the things that we have seen as we have um, been engaging with our audience through this year is one of the casualties for people of 2020 has been mm. the future. People are so in that survival mode. It's like, to use your language, it's like we're all collectively in this low side of of a six Mm -hmm. kind of place. You know, there's so much anxiety. There's so much focus on basic needs. There's so much focus on, you know, what bad thing is going to happen next. The people have stopped thinking about the future. They have stopped uh, really believing in the possibility Mm -hmm. of the future. And so I think that part of what our course, Your Best Year Ever, does is that it helps people, first of all, to believe in the future again. And we call that believe in the possibility. And we really, um, you know, talk about all that, uh, the idea of how our beliefs about the world shape our reality. And ultimately, you know, our beliefs shape our actions, which shape our results. And so we talk a lot about that and how you can ultimately believe something more empowering. And I feel like this year that has never been more necessary, you know, Um, but I also would say that's not enough. You know, you, you need to believe in the possibility, but the second step in our process is to complete the past. And we have to have some mechanism, especially after 2020 for processing mm-hmm. what we've been through. You know, if we, if we don't have a way to make sense of the the tough parts of the year we've just completed and really kind of put that to rest, then it's very difficult to move cleanly into the future. Um, So that's the second step. So we have believe in the possibility and then complete the past. And then what we really want is people to design Mm. the future. That's our third step. That's all about setting smarter goals. And so often what people think they're doing is setting goals, but what they're really doing is just kind of expressing an intention or an aspiration. And it's really not framed up in a way that ultimately they could take action on it and achieve it. And so for us, a smarter goal is something that is specific, it's measurable, it's actionable, It's risky, so it has to be risky (laughs) enough to get you out of your comfort zone. It's time keyed, so you have a date, but it's due. It's exciting, so it's inspiring. And it's relevant to your season of life. So this is where we make sure we don't do things like sign up for an Ironman. We just have a newborn (laughs) baby and our spouse is ready to wring our neck because we're training all weekend, right? So we have to consider where we are in our life. So this smarter framework, again, specific, measurable, actionable, risky, time keyed, exciting, and relevant is kind of the the bedrock of the program. So you use that to set your goals. Um, You're not going to set more than 12 goals for the year because focus really matters. We don't want you focused on more than three Mm -hmm. per quarter um, so that you can actually get it done. You know, sometimes people (laughs) set like 30 goals for the year and that's just a recipe to fail. 
Um, but once you've got your goals, you really want to be connected to your why. You want to find your why so that you can tap into the motivation that really matters to you, not that matters to somebody else. It's really important from the research. It's got to be, you know, intrinsic motivation. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, we help people get a plan. So that's it. I bet you guys find that. I mean, at least, you know, even with the Enneagram, what I find is people are always looking to their left or to their right. Like what goals are they setting? What are, you know, what are they doing? What should I do instead of focusing on you? And I don't mean that in a selfish way, in a really healthy way of who has God created me to be? What are my gifts? What are my struggles? As a nine, I know, man, I can plan my full focus planner like a champion, but I can get distracted so easily. Uh Like if I hear my goals and then all of a sudden someone wants to do something different, then I might accommodate or people please or go along to get along. And I've got to make sure that, you know, it's in step with the goals, with what I feel I'm called to. And I just have to really watch. Now, sometimes it's good to accommodate that, you know, that's, that can be a really healthy thing, but Mm -hmm. I have to I have to really think it through and weigh it out yeah. to, to make sure, is this the right thing to accommodate to, mm-hmm. or do I really need to stick with that goal? And yes. it can, woo, it's a slippery slope, but all growth slope. is uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but it's also really good. Yep. So Megan, in saying all that, as a type nine, when I'm setting goals, like I said, I can do it like the best of them. And, and that's me moving towards my three mm-hmm. and having some confidence and asserting yep. myself. Um, and threes are just so good at setting goals mm-hmm. and getting them done. Yep. That's where I need to be. Yep. So as a type four, where have you found going to one in yeah. your growth path? Where has that really benefited you? But also it's going to be hard. Like I said, it's a struggle. Yeah. Where has that been helpful for you to lean into? to that yeah. uh, one space. You know, I think that every now and then I feel this internal conflict about whether or not my rituals and my habits are restrictive, you know, because there's part mm. of me that just kind of likes to fly by the seat of my pants a little bit. Um, I'm, you know, pretty naturally productive. Um, so I don't really struggle with procrastinating very much. Uh, but sometimes the structure can feel constricting. And what I think Mm. I have discovered the older I've gotten is that habits are such a lifeline, you know, that really Mm. they make our life, especially as a busy mom with five kids. I mean, you know, I've got a lot going on (laughs) in my life that it helps me to do the things that really matter to me without so much effort. And so I've learned to embrace habits. For example, um, one of my goals this year was around exercise, consistent exercise, um, Mm. because I've done pretty well on that throughout the years. But this year, the first half of this year really was not good, you know, toward that. And probably a lot of us got off track on that. And so around the (laughs) summer, I really picked it back up again. And I just decided, you know what, I am going to do this habit six days a week, I'm going to I'm going to exercise six days a week. And what I found is that the more disciplined I was about doing it at exactly the same time every day in the same order in my morning ritual, that it became really easy. And I, I kind of discovered the I would say the benevolence of uh, discipline, you know, that there is, Mm. there's just kind of a, a kindness towards ourself when we use discipline, not as a weapon, you know, I think probably in the past, my shame, you know, propensity plus uh, that, that desire for discipline sometimes were not a great combination, but I think as I'm maturing, I'm figuring out how to do that without the shame, um, has, mm-hmm. it's just really a kindness because it enables me to have the things that create the kind of foundation that keep me in a place of equilibrium. So I would say that's really where that one going to one, you know, from a place of health is really beneficial for me. Yeah, that's so great. And I think it's so beneficial for people to, that's why the Enneagram is so helpful is because mm-hmm. it shows us where we can get tripped up yep. and how to get back on our healthiest path. So I always, you know, talk to people about using the Enneagram, like a rumble strip on the highway. Mm. You know, if we're falling asleep at the wheel, if we're distracted or yep. whatever's going on and we start to veer off, even if it's ever so slightly, eventually you're going to land into that pitfall. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that so often, but if we can set up those rumble strips of like for me, someone asked me to do something that's not in my planner or my goals, yep. I need to think through, is this the right time to accommodate? Mm-hmm. Or is that me just people pleasing? Yep. Um, and using that as a rumble strip to alert myself to have self observation, and mm-hmm. then to decide, well, 
is this the right healthy path or am I veering off course? And even Mm -hmm. sometimes pulling in Jeff or my team to ask them those clarifying questions, because sometimes I'm too close or I just don't see it. Um, And so that can be really, really beneficial. As I was thinking through uh, the tons of incredible points that are so helpful in thinking about goal setting, but as a type six, Mm -hmm. as it comes to routine, so part of, so I was adopted and, uh, my mother, my, uh, adoptive mother had an illness. And mm. so not only did I have my own kind of dysregulated internal world, yeah. but I had a mom who wasn't there to help me to learn how to regulate it. Wow. And so what that ended up me- meaning is that I became my own parent mm. at a very young age. Yeah. And one of the things that, um, you know, one about completing the past, Mm -hmm. there's a part of my past that I'm still living out in my present that I need to survive. Yeah. And whether that's, that's buying books on Amazon. My family laughs at me whenever (laughs) Amazon starts showing up at the door because I'm buying books out of anxiety. Um, so there's that part of it too. But then as it relates to the future, these this survival mentality mm-hmm. i don't like routine because it eliminates options oh interesting and so if you're running from if i'm r- trying to find security yeah. i want as many options sure. to find safety right so i've always thought of routine as that's just limiting an options if i need to do something right now what's fascinating and it speaks exactly to your point megan Whenever I find routine, Mm -hmm. my heart calms down. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally. My mind calms down. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's, it's almost like a, a child having boundaries from a healthy parent. I know the track that's laid for me. I, I, um, it's like to the nine side, Jeff (laughs) routines, peace. Yeah, see, routines do not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> routines for a nine. It's tricky. I know. I'm just kidding. Because a routine could be kind of this resignation to life. Like I'm just going to do my thing and do it. We each we time. have this standing yes. joke. Like Jeff, if you would just come to the healthy side of my type. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. But it, it, you're exactly right, Megan. I mean, there's there is this sense of how each type has an experience of routines mm-hmm. that either can prohibit their ability to walk in health Mm -hmm. and awareness. Um, Or, you know, it could be a frustration point where it just reminds them of these repeated unhealthy patterns of the past. Right. Right. It's kind of like um, I was thinking about when you were talking, it's almost like swaddling a baby. You know, I don't know if you guys Mm, remember. I don't know if that was a thing when your kids (laughs) were young. Yeah. I didn't start out with, with young kids. I started out with older kids and then worked my way backwards (laughs) to a baby. Like many things in my life, I've done it completely backwards. But I know with our youngest daughter who we adopted um, as a, as an infant that, you know, we would swaddle her when she was in the NICU. She was born really, really prematurely. And it was so calming to her to not have her arms and legs flailing around all over the place. You know, after right. all, she was born at 27 weeks. She was supposed to be still in the womb, you know? And so yeah. I don't know. I think that's kind of analogous to us as adults and how routine and rhythm and even, dare I say, discipline, you know, that's almost like a four letter word if you're a four, um, mm. it can really be, as I was talking about, a kindness in that, it, like you were saying, Jeff, it just calms us down and helps us to settle into our life. It actually creates more freedom, not really restriction mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Well, I, I don't want to belabor the point too long, but, um, one of, uh, the artist that I really appreciate is Jackson Pollock, mm-hmm. uh, who likely a four very expressive in his artwork, but it was during moments of discipline mm-hmm. and sobriety that he created most of his best work. Wow. Interesting. Whenever he was more self-absorbed and indulgent is when he got yeah. pushed off and it, he wasn't as productive as yep. what he could and he didn't produce as much. Mm-hmm. Um, it is interesting too. I will say this, uh, I, I use this as a illustration for just organizational life. But, but when you go to Chipotle versus Cheesecake Factory, you know, Chipotle, you know, like you're going to get a burrito either in a bowl or tortilla or uh, salad, a salad, right. But you're going to get a burrito versus um, Cheesecake Factory where there's so many options. Right. And what you end up doing is just picking the same thing that you've always picked because there's too many options. Um, And the reality of the 
there are rhythms to create that God has given us Mm -hmm. to operate at our fullest. And we can accept those rhythms and to recognize that we're going to have a response uh, to them. Well, and what's great with the Enneagram is it's, it's going to highlight what those rhythms and routines are for you Mm -hmm. in your Enneagram style. That's why the Enneagram is so great. It's like this foundation that everything else can be built on, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's goal setting or cleaning your home or parenting, whatever it is, there is this foundational understanding of why you think, feel, and behave in particular ways, what gets you off track, what keeps you in your healthiest path. And once you kind of understand that, then when you do start reading, you know, like a Michael Hyatt book on productivity and, or platform or living forward, like all those ones that I've really gleaned so much from, I can now filter it through my nine mind. Mm -hmm. What is going to be the most beneficial for me as a nine, even though this was written by a three, Mm -hmm. you know, what can I glean from him that's helpful for me, but also what do I need to tweak to make it really beneficial for me as a type nine? And that's where I think people can really get derailed fast is when they read books or they hear really great, you know, it could be sermons or teachings. They think I have to do it that way precisely. And I don't know if you've probably seen that probably all the time is Mm -hmm. that people really try to follow an exact method and they, they get off course. Do you see that a lot? We do. And, you know, kind of on this topic of goal setting, one of the things we hear a lot from people is we will have the, uh, the goal setting spouse in a marriage will be really drawn (laughs) to our, your best year ever program. And they'll be like super excited about getting their spouse to set goals too. But you can imagine this does not always go so well. And what often happens is that the non-goal setting spouse, you know, maybe that's somebody who's a nine or maybe they're a four or five. I don't know. You know, you could probably tell me the numbers that are the least inclined toward goal setting are resistant toward it. And it can really be a problem in their marriage. However, we've also had some of those same people. We Every year, we usually do something around couples um, and goal setting as some kind of a, an add-on or bonus or something along with the course. And this year, we've done the same mm-hmm. thing of couples in different stages of life that's included with the course. It's really neat. Um, but what we found is that when people can find their own reason for goal setting, you know, that um, is motivating to them when they can really get connected to their internal motivation, which is often very, very different if they're two different types, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, my, my own parents are three and a nine. My mom mm-hmm. never wanted to set goals until several years ago. And she kind of finally was able to do it on her own terms, not goals that my dad wanted her sure. to set, or she felt like <laughs> the kids wanted her to set, or somebody else told her she should set, you know, she really figured out what did she want. And that was very powerful for her. And now she is like an evangelist on goal setting because it's been so meaningful for her to be able to make things that matter to her as a nine happen in her life. And that's Mm. been super empowering. And it's been really special in their marriage for them to encourage each other Two very different approaches to the same concept. They're using even the same methodology and in the, your best Mm -hmm. year ever curriculum, but they're doing it in different ways. And I think, You know, if you're married to someone who maybe doesn't share your enthusiasm for goal setting or you're someone who thinks, yeah, that that goal setting thing just isn't for me. It's really about, you know, designing your future. It's really about what kind of Mm. life do you want to create? And goal setting is just a tool to help you get there. Um, And it's not something that's only for, say, Enneagram threes or Enneagram sevens or eights, you know, the aggressive numbers. You know, it's not just it's not just for those numbers. It's really what you bring to it and what you're kind of how you're willing to listen to yourself and get in touch with what matters to you. is so important. Well, I, I will say I've learned something new about you, Jeff. Oh, really? Yes. That's on awesome. That's just, wow. it's therapy. You, are, you changed our marriage, Megan. Wow, Thank I you. Feel I like this is such a privileged <laughs> position. <laughs> So all these years, so we've been married 25 years and I'm the one that wants to be the goal setter, you uh-huh. know, because intuitively before I knew the Enneagram, I just knew that I do better when I have goals yeah. or I, I follow a plan as a nine because yep. I can get off track and I can end up either doing nothing or I'll just follow everyone else. Right. So I've seen just naturally that I do better with goals. Mm-hmm. And so I'd be like every new year's like, okay, let's sit down and like, let's write our goals and mission statements and yeah. all these fun things. Um, knowing that when Jeff usually is, um, on a path 
we go, you know, like he is kind of a force of nature. Like we're just going to go. Um, but he was always reluctant to do this. And he was so frustrated. I'm like, this is important to me. Like, why are you doing it? But today it totally made sense Mm -hmm. that. Did you not know that about me? No, I asked you for years. We've paid thousands of dollars in (laughs) therapy. Amazing. (laughs) Surely. I mean, it's just like, oh, you need lots of options or you need an escape hatch. Like, what if this isn't going to work? What if this isn't safe? I mean, I mean, I probably could have intuitively known that, but no, you've never verbalized that. (laughs) And so now I'm like, I've known it this whole time. (laughs) Well, you've never (laughs) said it to me. read my mind. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Like all marriages say. No, but I think that's so, but this is where the Enneagram is so helpful Mm -hmm. because as an I, and it always kind of felt like I've said, this is important to me. It's important that we set goals. Cause if I don't have goals, I'm just going to wander. Um, and it felt like you, not that you didn't care about me, but that you didn't see how important this was Mm. to be my champion. Not, and and that's kind of, I mean, that is such a nine interpretation of my response. Exactly. Right. Right. And and I was always wanting to know, because I knew, and I know your heart that you're really for me, but it was always like, well, but if you know, if you're for me and this is important, like, why aren't you doing it? But now it's like, oh, and that's why the Enneagram is so powerful. Cause mm-hmm. I can go, you saw it from a totally different angle. It was more of a threat to you than it was empowering or helpful. And now it just makes me go, oh, okay, now we've learned how to navigate our own goals, you know, as we get older oh, I, and, yeah. and do our own thing. But, um, but this would have been very helpful. 20, well, and that's the next ago. area that I, I'd love to ask you about, Megan, is, okay, we, our nation, not only have we been going through yeah. a lot of chaos this year, but now we're going to add to it a season of failure. We're going to start setting mm-hmm. New Year's resolutions, <laughs> knowing that we're not going to do them by right, the end of January right. and feel even sadder about yeah. our lives. Oh. So, but I, I love this about completing the past and designing future because it mm-hmm. there is a temptation. I've noticed it inside of me. I wonder if it's true for everybody else, but there is this holding pattern mm-hmm. of... Right. Until vaccine, until yeah. something mm-hmm. substantial changes, yeah. I can't plan my life. Right. So we've got, I've got past failure mm-hmm. that I fail in particular ways as a type six. Yeah. Plus just feeling like I have unstable mm-hmm. sure. foundation underneath right. me. So really what are some of your year. thoughts about reluctant mm-hmm. goal setters yeah. and who facing failure, facing uncertainty mm-hmm. and coming into the new year? What advice would you have for them? Well, I mean, I I just appreciate you giving voice to that because I think that's how a lot of people feel. And if you're listening to this and you're listening to Jeff and you're thinking, man, that's me, you are not alone. You know, I'm I'm just here to tell you, I talk to people about this all the time. And this is just kind of like what's in the air that we're all breathing right now. It has been a truly traumatic year in so many ways. And for some people, that's capital T trauma, you know, for other people, that's lower Mm -hmm. T trauma. And so I think, you know, I always like to say it's important to know if which category you're in and whether or not you might need some professional help because um, probably now more than ever there, there is a real need sometimes for somebody to walk through processing. If it has been that capital T trauma, if you've lost someone you loved or you lost a job this year or something like that, you know, that those that you may really need a professional to walk beside you. And I think that's so valuable. I've done that many, many times myself. I've been in therapy mm-hmm. on and off for about 20 years and it's, it's just kind of part of my self-care, you know, and I think that that can really be beneficial. So I think that's always important to say at the beginning, just because goal setting is not a sub Institute for therapy. So, you know, we need to to make that clear. Um, But I think that part of what's necessary when that's the backdrop is you have to have a process that engages the narrative of the year, the reality of the challenges that you face. That's why we start with beliefs and that believe the possibility first step. And then we go into um, really processing through, you know, completing the past that you can't really get to designing your future unless you do those two things. You can't get to the future unless you are kind of trued up to the present. So that's Mm -hmm. one of the things that I would say in terms of my advice is use a process that takes you through these steps so that you're able to ultimately come to the part where you're designing your future and then you're finding your why and you're connecting with your plan about getting there from a place of 
of um, kind of doing business with these things and being able to have a fresh start because, you know, I think every year we have the, the, in the research, it's called the fresh start effect, you know, like the, every year we have this kind of milestone <laughs> feeling of this isn't a fresh start. Um, but I think this year, you know, people are really feeling they're anticipating that in good ways and bad ways. And the truth is, and I think this is the hard truth. Not a lot may change in 2021. You know, yeah. we may get through half the year or more before things substantially change. None of us know. I mean, mercifully, hopefully things sure. will be faster than that. However, I hope what people discover in this goal setting process is there are certainly so many things we can't control. And I think that is, mm -hmm. you know, if I had anything that was kind of like my subtext of 2020, it would be, you know, there's so many things we can't control. But on the other hand, there are enough things that we can control that you can have a different experience of 2021, even if the circumstances were exactly the same as 2020. You just have to understand how to kind of put your arms around that and walk into it. And, and that's what I hope for people with regard to goal setting is goal setting can be a tool to take your future back regardless of what the circumstances are. Absolutely. You know what I love about that is that uh, Sometimes whenever I hear literature, I mean, this is a very sick suspiciousness uh, <laughs> thought, but, um, and, but it, it, it's an appreciation because sometimes whenever I read stuff about productivity or I read about goal setting, I think of triumphalism, yeah. not Trumpism, right. triumphalism. Right. <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> to be clear. But kind of this, you can be a hero, right. you can transcend right. But that I I did not hear a hint of that whenever you were just like here. If you need to grieve, make it your goal yeah. to grieve during this season. Right. And if we're not, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to somehow uh, transcend the pandemic. We're right. going to experience some element of powerlessness. Yes. Mm -hmm. But your experience of your own personal life, the life of your family mm -hmm. in the midst of difficulty yeah. can be radically different. And if you can capture a vision for what it is that you desire, your why mm -hmm. and the what and the how that you're going to uh, go about it. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't, this isn't triumphalism. This yeah. isn't no. heroism. This is, this is pr simply you being at the fullest of your humanity, of your right. God-given self that totally. you can be in a season such as this. You know, this mm -hmm. reminds me of the Stockdale paradox. And this is, this is such a great concept. So this is a story about Admiral James Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war um, in the Vietnam War, I believe. And he was held for a long, long time. And he saw many people come and go, many people who went had died, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they did not, they did not make it. And they mostly did not make it because they died of a broken heart. They said things like by Christmas, we'll be out and Christmas would come and go mm -hmm. and, and they would be heartbroken. And so what he discovered when someone was asking him after he was finally released, how, how did you make it? He said, you know, I did two things that made it work. First of all, I confronted the brutal realities of my situation. And so there was no denying that this was a torturous, awful situation that he was in. But he said, I simultaneously never lost hope that I would prevail in the end. And I think mm, that wow. Stockdale paradox is such a great model for 2020. On the one hand, we have to own and be real about the brutal realities of our situation. And it has been brutal. And at the same time, we have to never lose faith, faith that we will triumph in the end. And that is really, I think, kind of what makes up resilience. And that's really what we're talking mm. about here. I love that word. Well, and with that, um, what are some resources that or programs or courses that you guys have yeah. at Michael Hyatt and company that you offer people to really, you know, take these next steps? Yeah. Uh, what can you offer our listeners? Yeah. Well, the thing that I would say is the best place to start is our Your Best Year Ever course. Um, that is going to, there's several different versions of it, but that's really going to walk you through this five-step process um, that I've talked about today. And, you know, you can do it with a spouse, you could do it with a friend, you could do it over Zoom. Um, if you're not able to be together with people, but this is a powerful process that will result in you having not only a set of annual goals that you are personally really connected to and excited about, but a plan for accomplishing those goals. And so you can find out about that at uh, bestyourever.me slash limited. So bestyourever.me slash limited. And the reason you want to put that slash limited is because that's a hundred dollar off 
um, link. Ooh. So you get like the special inside track link. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yes. so fun. Don't yes. forget that. We'll put it in the show notes okay, too. But great. Yes. Don't forget that. Yeah. Anything else you guys have that, you know, like books or resources that you want to also highlight? Real I, quick? Think, I think that would be the best thing. You know, once you've set your goals, if you're really looking for a way to make sure you stay on track with your goals, you have a process for operationalizing those. The full focus planner, um, which is our planner product, would be the best thing for that. We actually created it because we had people asking us for a solution to help them keep their goals sure. in front of them all year and really take their annual goals and ultimately chunk those down into a quarterly focus and weekly objectives and the daily tasks, you know, how do we make our daily tasks related ultimately to our goals? And so that's what the full focus planner does. And that's just fullfocusplanner.com. That's great. Megan, it's been wonderful. And uh, it, it, this is a, a significant moment for us in one sense, because it, uh, all, all of this began in your home mm-hmm. and for it to come this far, I'm like, holy cow, man, this is this has been a crazy ride for us <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. being here in Nashville. Highs and lows and then highs again. But we, we can't speak more highly of you and what the Hyatt team has meant to us because it it was such a gift from our father for something mm. that lay dormant for decades. I mean, wow. 2001 is when we got Richard Rohr's book mm. and it just, we quietly didn't take action. And uh, being Beth, being around your team, my wife woke up to a dream wow. and she went for it. And so super grateful mm. for all that you guys have done and continue to do. And we're so delighted that you yeah, joined I mean, us on our podcast. And, you know, I always tell your parents, like I just put into action all the things that you guys yeah. have taught. I mean, maybe not everything that you've taught. <laughs> I probably don't know all of it yet. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but That's awesome. All that I could muster up. I just was like, okay, they said, do this and let's do this. And they said, do that. Let's do that. And, it just, it's worked and it's been Mm. beautiful and it's been a joy. Um, but not only that, I think, you know, Jeff and I just want to reiterate how not just the productivity side and all things that you guys have learned, we've learned about leadership through you guys, but just watching Mm. your team, watching you guys as leaders, um, being authentic and real and literally doing what you guys say, Mm. you know, like when, when you guys teach a method, I see you guys are doing that method mm. behind the scenes. And well, I just think you. that that speaks volumes um, to your leadership style and just who you guys are as, you know, people and dear friends. So just thank mm. you so much for being such a huge part of our personal life, but also how your Enneagram coach got started. Now all wow. the people that are listening get to be blessed as well. So thank you. Well, thank you guys. I mean, wow, it's just amazing to hear that story. I feel so privileged to have gotten to be part of your story <laughs> and you guys are making an incredible impact on the world for good. So thank you for listening to that voice inside of yourself and taking that risk. That's something a lot of people don't do. Um, and there's so many people who are better for it. So thank you guys. Mm. We hope this interview was as helpful to you guys as it was for us. It's a strange time, 2020, right? To be thinking about goals coming up in 2021, it feels like it's impossible, right? But it's important to have a plan and to be aware of what causes us to fail at our goal setting process. So being aware is key. And we're going to continue this conversation next week by walking the wheel with each of the nine types. So join us to learn about your type specific goal killers, how to recognize them and how to move past them in order to reach your goals in 2021. But always remember this, the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It's the gospel that transforms us. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to take the Enneagram journey to the next level, we invite you to check out our free Any What mini course. In Any What, I teach you about the Enneagram, how to find your type, and how to use the acronym AWARE to help you to more effectively apply the Enneagram to your life. To get started with Any What mini course, simply click in the link in the show notes. So don't miss out on this opportunity to unlock the power of the Enneagram with our free mini course. Again, thanks again for tuning in and we look forward to supporting you on this journey.